Good morning, or good afternoon, or good evening, depending on when you're watching this. Uh, I hope that uh, you're prepared to hear from God this morning, or whenever you're, whenever, like I say, whenever you're watching it. But I hope that you're you're prepared, uh, because He's definitely going to speak loudly and clearly through His Word this morning. Uh, so, um, with that being said, let's 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 go to prayer. Let's start with a word of prayer, and then we're gonna. We're going to get started. Lord God, I come to you and I thank you. I thank you for each and every person that is under the sound of my voice. Dear Lord, I pray that you prepare their hearts to receive your truth this morning. I empty myself completely out. I wanted nothing of Bobby Joe. Bobby Joe cannot change anyone, but your spirit can, living in me, working through me. And I just pray that your words are what is heard and received this morning. Meet each person right where they're at, right where they're at, speaking exactly of of what they need to hear this morning. Dear Lord, I love you, I praise you, and I thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. We started a series last week on called Living Hope, uh, Living with Hope. And last week we talked about the basic basis of our hope is in Jesus Christ and who we are in Christ. Uh, we are going through the book of First Peter uh, today. First uh, Peter is going to put legs with that hope. And, and how when we receive that hope, when we receive Christ, changes should take place in how we view the world. So, and how we definitely live in it. Uh, but I want to start with a question that should, uh, should really strike some interest. I hope you could have, uh, if you want to pause it and just talk about it or discuss it over table talk later. But what is something you're really looking forward to? Um, something you're really looking forward to. And as you think, I know there's a lot of different variables that go in, it, whether short term, long term. Um, so, you know, things that you really look forward to says a lot about us, I believe. Uh, a lot of things that we're working towards, you know, putting a lot of time in towards. So, so really, you know, it's a great question to think about and assess yourself with. Um, you know, when I when I answered this, you know, I had all kinds of things. You know, today, right now, uh, I'm looking forward to going to the swimming pool uh, with my kids, uh, taking them and enjoying some family time. I'm really looking forward to that. Um, I'm looking forward to vacation that we're going to be going on next month. Um, I'm looking forward to getting back face to face with my students at school. Something that I, I definitely missed uh, the last two months, three months of school. Uh, you know, I'm really looking forward to uh, my next opportunity to go to Haiti uh, and be able to hold those orphans and, and talk and interact with them. You know, but all that being said, and I could go on and on about things that I am really looking forward to, uh, my eternal destination, it, it has to be first and foremost. And I know that is the, the church answer but that should change everything about how we live in this world uh, is our eternal destination of being heaven and looking forward to that, never swaying too far from that. You know, but we've got so many things in this world that will distract us and will definitely pull our focus off of that eternal perspective. You know, I, I, I look to Jesus. Jesus was tempted in all the ways that we were. He had the same distractions that were out there. Uh, you know, it was a different day and time, but still, for his time, when, when he walked this earth, he was, he was tempted just like us to be pulled away, to have his focus uh, taken off um, of what God planned for him. But in all that, he never got distracted from the purpose his father had for him. Um, you know, and neither should we. Uh, but it, it depends on how much time are we putting into uh, focusing on Christ and our relationship with him. So, you know, how distracted are you uh, right now, where you are? With that being said, you know, focusing on our hope, and we talked about that last week, defining it and just really talking about what hope is uh, before really diving in and, and talking about, you know, the basis of our hope, you know, I, I just ask you, where is your hope? You know, what is your hope in? You know, a lot of us put hope in a plan 
uh, that's going to lead to a successful job, uh, a great retirement. Um, we put hope in um, a school system uh, that is going to prepare us for uh, the rest of our life. Uh, and what we do, we put hope in in uh, a family and 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 having kids and uh, you know a wonderful wife and having a house and car and all of those things, you know. But I want you to know right up front that nothing in this life provides the hope for a certain future that we desire. Nothing in this life has the hope of a certain future that we desire. There is no certainties in this world. There is no certainty. So wrap your mind around that. You know, it is great to have plans. You know, I love Proverbs uh, 16, 9, you know, that it says man plans his course, but, you know, and I love that but. You know, usually I say, hey, don't put the but in there. But in this case, but God directs his steps. We are to have plans, and it's great to have plans, but no, God directs your steps. And some of the, the great change of plans that God makes man, are some of the greatest things you'll experience. But you've got to know that up front, that with your plans, it may not line up with God's will. You know, some of my greatest testimonies are when God changed my plans. Some of the greatest testimonies are, are God's changed plans in my life. Uh, where my plans didn't line up with his. But I, I can tell you, uh, with, with everything inside of me, his plans were far better. And I praise him for those uh, changes. So know that Jesus will not let you down. He will not let you down uh, if you will put your hope in him. So with that being said, you know we're going to dive in right here. First Peter uh, chapter 1, and today we're going to focus on 13 through 25. Uh, we skip a little short section, verses 10 through 12, to where Peter is referencing the Old Testament prophets and how the prophets brought the message and how the message has been shared uh, and, and seen and experienced by these believers that Peter is talking to. So we kind of pick up there with Peter reminding the believers of that and just calling them to ready themselves, uh, to, to prepare to take action, uh, you know, putting feet with your hope, uh, if, you, if, if I may. But it says in, in verses 13 through 16, so if you haven't grabbed your Bible, take a second right now, grab your Bible, a pen, notepad, something you can jot notes down with or, or questions um, so that you may talk about and discuss later or look up later uh, if something jumps out at you. But uh, verse 13, therefore... With your mind ready for with your minds ready for action, be sober minded and set your hope completely on the grace to be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the desires of your former ignorance. But as the one who called you is holy, you also are to be holy in all your conduct. For it is written, Be holy, because I am holy. And you know, I love Peter right here really preparing us and not just uh, not just saying be ready, but he's giving us specific uh, ways in which to prepare ourselves. But, you know, the previous lesson talked about who we are in Christ. You know, but Peter's calling us here now, we got to put this thing to action. You know, it's just not something that we sit around on, keep in our back pocket, uh, hide it, you know, the hope that we live has everything, has, has everything to do with the way in which we view the world and the way in which we live in this world. Uh, you know, Peter understood right here, as he is telling these believers who are struggling, uh, he knew that suffering was to come, that there was going to be a fight, and it was a spiritual battle. You know, Peter knew that it was not going to be with swords and, and, and sticks and stones, you know, this was a, a battle of the mind. Uh, you know, it's about thoughts, attitudes, worries, desires. And I believe Peter is looking back into his own life as he is writing this and using some of the times when he wasn't prepared mentally 
for what was getting ready to take place and the suffering he was going to endure and see. You know, and I think back as I re read this, you know, the Spirit really brought to my mind Peter in the garden when God had told him and, and his other brothers to, to pray, to stay ready, to pray. And he told them it multiple times as Jesus went off by himself, but came back and found them sleeping. And then when the time had come for Jesus to be handed over, what did Peter do? Peter jumped up and he was ready. He hey, grabbed his sword, cut off an ear. Peter was ready to battle with swords and sticks and stones, a physical battle. But he was not prepared. His mind was not ready. And I believe Peter is drawing from that right now, as well as other times in his life to where God opened his eyes to exactly of the battle that he was having to endure and the things he was call, that God was calling him to do. So, you know, with that being said, you know, in this world, you know, this world that God created is not evil in itself. We see so much greatness and glory in it. It's not evil in itself. You know, we have many great things here. You know, we, just like I said earlier, you know, I'm looking forward to swimming pools, you know, which is something somebody had to purchase. It was a, it was a purchase that someone had to, had to do. You know, also a vacation is, is something that we have to plan and sacrifice time and pay for. You know, we have houses, we have, have, have gifts that we give. Uh, we have money that we earn. Uh, we go to school and pay a lot of money to have a successful job. You know, this world in itself is not evil. However, we must be aware that Satan controls this world system. Satan is the prince of this world. And that he is waiting to use any good gift for evil and make it an idol in your life if he can do it. To take your mind off Christ to where you apply more on your hobby or on something of this world, your job, on money than on Christ, which completely distorts the perspective in which you as a believer should have. So, you know, Peter uh, comes in with, with five specific ideas to help us ready our mind. And, you know, and I, and I think, and I just want you to be thinking in your own mind, uh, you know, what are some things that God has used in the past to ready your mind right now where you're at? Because I know there's been areas in which God has, has allowed you to see that maybe you wasn't as prepared as you needed for a response or a situation. And he's growing you in those. So just as I believe he had did in Peter, and Peter recalling them here, what, is he, uh, what has he done in your life? So, you know, think about uh, how you can keep your mind ready for action, you know. And Peter gives some great ideas right here. You know, one is to be ready. You know, just be ready. Uh, you know, and that is applying yourself to the Word, to, uh, to fellowship, and just being ready for a situation or circumstance that is to come. You know, as, as ready as you can be. You know, and I think back to in Egypt, you know, during the, the Passover, when, uh, when, God had called all the Israelites to put their uh, put the lamb's blood on the doors and he was going to pass over them. But he told them inside, be ready. Have your sandals on. You know, ready to go at any time, any second. And I think that's how we've got to prepare ourselves. Not that we're worried with anxiety and all that, but preparing ourselves for the moment that is to come that we cannot plan for. But be ready. You know, be clear thinking. You know, that you sober-minded. Do not be intoxicated with the world. Know your limitations. Know what gets at your emotions, pushes your buttons. You know, social media might be that. Because uh, you have so much different variety and perspective on there. So, but be clear thinking. Don't clout your mind. You know, another thing, you know, you is, is with alcohol or drugs or any of that. You know, I don't even believe Peter is really talking about that right here. Peter is talking more about just deceit from the world. You know, false prophets that has come into play. Keep your mind clear and, and completely focused on the truth. You know, be hopeful. You know, be hopeful. Trust in God. Trust in God. That God is in absolute control. You know, be distinct. You know, you're not better than anybody, but you should stick out. 
because Christ makes you different. You know, you, and, and you know, Peter's even saying, you know, do not go back to the desires of your former self. So be distinct. Christ makes you new. You have new desires, new understanding. And last but not least, be holy. You know, God is holy. He is fully set apart from everything else. And God didn't call us to just be pretty good or just better than the other person. God calls us to be holy, to be like Jesus. And so I ask you, are you holy? Because God is telling us, and many of us would say, well, what? No way. But Christ should be making us holy each and every day. But the only way we can get holy is if we get close to Christ. Growing in that Christ likeness. You know, and I and I and I I encourage you, invest in your relationship with Christ. And you'll see, others will see and experience the holiness of Christ through you. First Peter, next section, 17 through 21. If you appeal to the Father who judges impartially according to each one's work, you are to conduct yourselves in reverence during your time living as strangers. For you know that you were redeemed. And you see Peter right here talking to ones that have been redeemed. These are believers. Uh, from your empty way of life inherited from your fathers, not with perishable things like silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. Like that of an unblemished and spotless lamb, he was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was revealed in these last times for you. Through him, you believe in God, who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. Um, you know, and I love, I want to focus on really one aspect of this, and, and it is being redeemed, redemption. Redemption is a huge word that has huge implications, you know, for our walk with Christ. We have been redeemed. Uh, and, you know, just a brief definition uh, is to release a slave or prisoner by paying a ransom. To release a slave or prisoner by paying a ransom. We are all born into slavery. Because of Adam, we are all born into slavery. We are a slave to our sin. But praise be to God that he sent his son to pay the price with his blood, with his life, which pays the ransom and sets me free, sets you free. We must just receive that gift, recognize it that we are a sinner, confess them sins, confess your sins, receive Christ's blood, and be set free, calling him Lord of your life, letting him be Lord of your life. But you know, as we look at the world itself right now, it's not, it's not going about things. It's not getting better. Yes, it's making progress. You know, science, medicine, technology, we are making huge in worldly advances. And all things that can be that are being used in great ways. But morally, you know, the truth is that morally, relationally, from relationships, spiritually, we're as broken as ever. You know, I'm reading in the Old Testament right now, and so much of the Old Testament just mirrors exactly of what we are going through right now. You know, but Jesus said, you know, he came to give us life and give it abundantly. You know, John 10.10 10 specifically says that, but we must acknowledge that life apart from him, and this is the kicker, life apart from Jesus is empty. And we can do nothing to change that. Life apart from Christ is empty, unfulfilling. We must acknowledge that. If not, we'll keep right on chasing that world. And we'll just keep living it up. You know, redemption through Christ was always God's eternal plan. And I love this. You can go back to Genesis 3. Genesis 3.15 talks about uh, where uh, talking about Satan will strike his heel. But I believe, you know, foreshadowing Jesus will crush his head. Jesus defeated death with his resurrection. Through the resurrection of Christ, death is defeated. Satan was crushed. Um, salvation was framed in eternity, and it was revealed at God's perfect time. God's timing is always perfect. Peter looked back at the resurrection here, 
as the basis for our hope and faith. Without triumph of God raising Jesus from the dead, we truly are without hope and have nothing in which to place our confident faith in. Without the resurrection, we are hopeless. Life is meaningless. Because if Jesus was not raised from the dead, then his blood could not have covered for our sins because he was a mere human. Died just like everyone else has died that we've seen. So his blood obviously did not have the cleansing power. Therefore, we are still in our sins. However, Jesus was raised from the dead. Therefore, we as believers, those trusting in Christ, calling him Lord of your life, will be raised with him. So I ask you, are you redeemed? Are you redeemed? Have you received Christ? Have you been set free of your sins and received that payment through Jesus' sacrifice? Do you call Jesus Lord of your life? And how do you know? That's the big thing. If you say yes, 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 how do you know? There should be evidence all over your life from the time that you were saved. And maybe that's not very long. Maybe that is a long time, depending on when that took place. But you should be able to see evidence of your salvation. Others, more importantly, should be able to see evidence of your change. But look for that evidence. Think about that evidence, because I know if you are a believer, that evidence is there, and you can see that. And that's exciting. I know I've seen evidence in plenty of people, so come ask me <laughs> if, if, uh, if I know you well. And I, I, I am sure I can give you evidence. Our last part right here, a uh, great part to finish up with, verses 22 through 25. Since you have purified yourself by your obedience to the truth so that you show sincere brotherly love for each other, from a pure heart, love one another constantly because you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God, for all flesh is like grass." And all its glory like a flower of the grass. The grass withers and the flower falls, but the word of the Lord endures forever. And this word is the gospel that was proclaimed to you. Peter clearly articulates that when it came to living out the hope and faith, the word of God is our only guide. The word of God is our only guide. Our obedience brings about a purification. Our obedience to the word brings about a purification. And that purity overflows in sincere love for one another. And I know that was a lot right there. But if we obey God's word, his truth, then it purifies and cleanses our heart and causes us to love others with a deep, brotherly, sincere love. But that obedience has to come first. So we have to know what are we obeying. There's where the word of God comes in. It is the truth. The only truth. So be careful here. Be careful because there are other truths that are wanting to come in and penetrate God's word. And you've got to be educated and understand God's truth so that you know what is 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 adding to what is uh, complimenting God's word because there's so many great authors out there there's so much great testimonies out there that are complimenting God's word built on his truth but complimenting it as people bring personal testimony and and and, and their, uh, their their life experiences to it but there's so much false prophecy that's coming in and trying to penetrate God's word as well so be on guard, but you must know his truth because if not, you're not going to obey it. You're not going to obey a word that you don't believe in. You're not going to obey someone that you have no faith in or, or no love for or no relationship with. So that obedience is key to purifying our hearts so that we love one another. And you know, the two greatest commandments, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. And then Jesus said the second one is just like it, love your neighbor as yourself. But you've got to love God first. You've got to want to obey God in order to love others. Because it's hard to love people. It's hard. And they make it hard. And especially when we're all at different levels. 
And you know, and I love how it how it ends with this right here. You know, Peter's calling us, and he's not even commanding. He's he's assuming here that we are as Christians are going to love people. He's just assuming it. He's not even commanding it. But you know, calling us to make sure we love others constantly. You know, displaying sincere brotherly love. You know, this is this is just you know a firm point for Christians. But I believe he's not calling us just to love Christians here, but to love all people, all people. You know, and we're at such a time right now to where we are torn between loving all people, I believe. And, you know, I God has done such a work in this time. You know, and God will take every bad situation. Romans 8, 28. You know, God wants to do good in everything, and he will in the lives of those that love him and acknowledge him. He will work good. And he is working so much good in me right now as he's revealed areas of my life that I didn't know were there, that I didn't know existed. And he is revealing those things and just growing me in my relationship. And, you know, I want to show a sign that I struggled to write, that I struggled to write, and not for the reasons in which you might think, because I love God's creation. God is not colorblind. God is not colorblind. God created colors to be beautiful. To be beautiful. And I love his diversity. Love it with a passion. I love all people. But I struggled in, in writing this sign. And I want to repent and confess to you right now. I struggled in writing this sign. Because of the world's view upon this sign. But I'm here to tell you that black lives do matter. They do matter. And because I have this sign and I show this sign, absolutely does not mean that other lives don't matter. And that was my hold up on, not on writing this sign. Was Does that mean that you don't think other lives do matter? Absolutely not. But I know that that my black brothers and sisters in Christ and those even outside of Christ that have not received that, they are hurting right now. And I hurt with them. And I know that God loves them as he created them just like he did me. God loves them. And he is speaking into me. They do matter. And at this point in time, we have such an opportunity to show Christ's love to them. And I believe God is calling us to do just that. To do just that. You know, I, I love a, a, a story, a passage that comes to my mind when I think about this is the Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan. The Good Samaritan after multiple people had walked by and left the hurting man on the side of the road, the Good Samaritan came by and took care of him because he saw a man hurt, hurting. In this case, it was a man physically hurting. But I'm, when I say hurting, I'm, I'm talking physically, emotionally, spiritually, however you want to define hurting. But that Good Samaritan did not ask questions. He did not say, hey, what's happened? What, what got you here? He did not even, he did not even acknowledge what got him there? He just saw someone hurting, and he took care of him. He provided for him physically, emotionally, financially, and just took care of it. And I believe that's what God is calling us to do. He is calling us to love just like that. He is calling us to love all people. And where we stand right now, the community, the African-American community, they are hurting. They are hurting. And I believe that he is calling all people to love them. And I, you know, right here, God says, you know, in his word, 1 John 4, 20 through 21, says if you say that you love God but you hate your brother, then you're a liar. Plain, plain and simple. You know, I believe... And God's word confirms that it's impossible to love God's truth and hate another person. 
You know, love for one another is one of the defining marks of Christianity. Love for one another. Your love shows your knowledge of God's Word. I think it shows your relationship. is how you love others. I believe that's a great defining point of how close you are with Christ. Is how you love others. And I don't condone sin. I don't condone anything outside of God's Word, the truth. But I know all need love. And I know, even I can look back through Scripture and pull out godly figures that when they suffered from anger, hate, fear, those emotions, when they experienced them, it caused them to do things that were unheard of. It caused them to do things that they look back on and, and did regret. But it was love of others in their approach to them that helped reveal that to them. So I'm calling us right now as believers to love a community. Love a community that is hurting. Love those brothers and sisters. Let them see Christ in you. And those that are not followers of Christ, how else are they going to come to know that truth to receive that truth if they don't experience that truth through you. So I'm calling us to love. I believe God is calling us to love. You know, the Word of God shows us how to love sincerely. We can't love in this way without knowing God's Word. We can't because it's not a love of this world. I mean, you can look around and you can see the, the love of this world is very tainted. It's definitely not sacrificial, unconditional, the way Christ's love was. You know, Peter even gives two specific words to define God's word right here. He said God's word is living, which means it's alive. It's alive and active. All you have to do is read it and apply it. Meditate on it. But you've got to make it a part of your life. If not, someone else is going to be telling you God's word, and how do you know that their opinion doesn't get involved in that? Also, God's Word is enduring. It's here to stay. Regardless if you receive it or not, God, it doesn't change the truth of God's Word. Regardless if you read it or not, it is still present. And it's unchanging. It's the only thing that is unchanging in this world and that has been unchanging in this world. So I pray that you will read it, you'll believe it, and you'll apply it. And look at what it will do for you. You know, I want to end, you know, I, I had an opportunity this morning to go uh, to the abortion clinic in Louisville and to be able to just peacefully protest. And I want you to know, you know, when I talk about black lives matter, then so does unborn lives. They matter. Orphans matter. White lives matter. Hispanic lives matter. All lives matter because God has created them all. But I went to the abortion clinic because my heart hurts for the unborn child because he has no voice. It has no voice. However, please know that I went there not just out of love for that unborn child, but out of love for that mother that is carrying that unborn child. And I went to love on her, to give an encouraging word in any way that may let her feel the love of Jesus, which would change her mind, possibly, and see that, hey, there's other options. You don't have to do this. To love on that, that boyfriend or the, the father of that child that may be walking with them, to be able to love on him and to show him Christ's love and say, I'm just not here for the child. I'm here for you. Because if the parents are not feeling that love of Christ, they're not going to feel the change that is going to allow them to make a decision to see that baby as a blessing. So I, I want you to know that all life does matter. And Christ presents opportunities all the time in this world to where people are hurting for us to love them. And I call you to love. Love them through the suffering, the struggles, the frustrations. Build a relationship so that you can understand where the hurt and the suffering comes from. 
that someone is going through. And right now we have specific ways with, with the protest that we have, we have seen with the pandemic that we are going through with the coronavirus. But don't just limit it to them two. Those two are our immediate calls right now to show the love of Christ. But don't just limit it to them as there will be all kinds of opportunities that will come your way for you to show the love of Christ. And I pray that through His Word, more and more of His truth and the way in which He wants us to love will be revealed to you as I pray that it is revealed to me constantly. Let us pray. Lord God, I come to you and I, and I thank you. I thank you for your living Word. Your Word that has endured uh, the test of time. Unchanging, fixed. I pray over all that are under the sound of my voice and that have received your message through this, that you touch their hearts in a way in which allows them to, to meditate upon it, to meditate upon their own heart and their walk with you and where they need to grow, things that need to be revealed to them. I pray that you would reveal it to them. Dear Lord, you call us to love all peoples and you present opportunities right in front of us that give us the opportunity to show that love. And dear Lord, they're not going to see it if we as believers don't show it. We are held accountable for that. And I pray that you would give us the boldness and courage. But dear Lord, give us the response of Christ when we acknowledge and when we, when we show that love. I pray, dear Lord, I pray that you will minister to each and every one that will look upon this video and that will receive this lesson. Lord, I love you. I thank you for the love that you have shown me, so undeserving of it, and how you continue to grow me and open my eyes to your truth more and more. And I thank you. I thank you for that, and I pray that for each and every person. I love you. It's in the name of Jesus that I pray and lift all this up. Amen. Wish you all a great afternoon. God bless.